Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Wildlife for Lunch webinar. Today's presentation will be on quail management, and it is presented by our expert, Dale Rollins. He is a professor and an extension wildlife specialist with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. Today's Wildlife for Lunch program is made possible through funding by the San Antonio Livestock Exposition, Inc., and is hosted by the Texas Wildlife Association and the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. There are no CEU credits offered in today's webinar, but after the program, a window should pop up with a post-webinar survey, and we would love to hear your thoughts on today's program. So please fill that out if you can. And with that, I'm going to switch over to the program and get started. So here we go. OK, can you hear me, Eleanor? I certainly can. OK, I uh, appreciate all you folks joining us for lunch today to talk about my favorite subject, that being quail management. Uh, you got to appreciate that in an hour, we're not going to cover all of quail management. Certainly, we could talk for days, if not months, about this. So we're going to hit some high spots. And especially, we're going to talk about the concept of usable space and how we can apply that to our landscape and what some of the uh, potential problems could be with some of our uh, other land use situations. So we'll talk about that relative to our favorite species, the bobwhite. I have two uh, advertorials here I want to throw out to you. If you have not uh, heard of the Bob White Brigade, it's a wildlife leadership camp. Uh, it's been cloned now to other camps as well. Uh, the Texas Wildlife Association and other agencies host this. If you have a youngster 13 to 17 years of age or you are an adult that would like to learn more about Bob White, whitetail, turkey, waterfowl, or bass management, we'll sign up as a cubby leader. We'd love to have you. And there's more information there at that website. Uh, we need your money, we need your time, but especially we need your kids. So um, certainly get those in, uh, those applications in ASAP. The uh, next thing we're doing, is, and I noticed when I perused the list of participants a while ago, we have several uh, former quail masters uh, that, that are attending today's show. For some reason, Eleanor keeps the one back to slide one. Uh, but we will be having uh, Quail Masters 2013. Now, the timeline is really short on this. It starts Sunday, but if you have an interest in that, it's a series of four three-day workshops. And uh, email me after the uh, presentation if you can arrange your schedule and join us as early as this Sunday for that. OK, we'll start off with a poll just so you can get used to how to uh, answer a question as we go through here. So here's a really simple one. Quail can be aged by examining what? Their molar teeth, their facial color, or their wing feathers. And uh, Eleanor, I'm going to ask that you let them know how they can poll. All right, I'm going to activate it right now. All right, there we go. It should be up. So please click on one of those three, and I'll give you about 10 seconds to answer that, and then we'll see how the uh, group scored on that. Hopefully those former quail masters and any past Bob White will get this correct. OK, Eleanor, let's close the poll and you show us the results, please. You there, Eleanor? I am. It's, uh, it's waiting. People are still answering right now. Okay. It's taking a couple seconds. All right, and there we go. All right, so 65% of you got it correct. It's by looking at the primary coverts, the upper side of the uh, wing, and uh, that's just one, one of the skills that you would want to do and want to learn as you aspire to be a student of quail. All right, the overview for today's seminar, we're going to talk a little bit about the decline of quail. Uh, what I always promote students to do and that is think like a quail, the concept of usable space and how that applies to quail management, uh, some pinch points between perhaps quail management versus the livestock management, and then uh, 
uh, introduce you to some online resources that uh, may be useful to you because, again, we're only going to hit some high spots here over the next 50 minutes. Uh, as we think about the decline of quail, this, is, this graph is from Texas Parks and Wildlife Roadside Cast that they conduct each August. This is for the Rolling Plains, but it's, uh, it's similar in South Texas. It's even more dire uh, in eco regions east of the Rolling Plains in South Texas. But I especially want you to look at the last several years. Well, first of all, look at 1994. As I look at these graphs, and if South Texas was on here, it'd be similar. It looks to me like something happened, and I don't have a clue what it is, but I always solicit your ideas. After about 1994, our quail populations, while still boom and bust, they don't boom nearly as well. And as you can see, about, uh, I think it's like 15 out of the last 19 years have been below the long-term mean. So if you got any ideas of what happened about that time frame, I'm all ears. And again, that's what we're concerned about is how the populations just haven't responded very well in recent years. And if you look at the last three years, those are record low years for the rolling plains. And we know a big part of that is due to the drought that we've been mired in. But we're curious about some other factors that could be involved with that. I'd like to use this uh, slide and this question just to get you to thinking about your management goals. And are you a quail miner or a quail manager? And you might say, well, how do I know? If you're only using quail and not doing anything to conserve their long-term future, you're more of a miner, just as you might be if you were extracting oil, gas, or coal. But a natural resource, a renewable natural resource, we like to think and we like to aspire to become managers. This is a slide that I use as a, what I call a quail-proof fence. Over here on the left-hand side, let me get my marker here. Over here on this side, obviously, and not much uh, habitat for quail management, just across the fence, much better nesting conditions, still a little bit light on brush. But uh, you can see that it, this guy over here might have complained about uh, lack of rainfall, but it didn't stop at that fence. So just keep in mind that your management is an important part of this. And if all the quail are flying from the left to the right, that indicates the manager's on the right side of the fence. All right, just a little bit of math, a little bit of uh, algebraic expression as it relates to quail. If we could simplify a quail equation and make it as simple as we could, reduce it to its simplest terms, it might be this. Usable space plus rainfall equals quail abundance. And in many circles, both professional as well as at the coffee shop, that's what it is. I mean, that's as simple as it gets. And uh, we're, you either when, you have, when it rains, you'll have quail. If it don't, you won't kind of a, a philosophy. I can't argue that all that's false, but it uh, may be more may may make it it may be more simple than I think it is in the real world. So sometimes the equation gets quite complex and I tell students in quail masters that the longer you think about the situation, the more complex it becomes. Anytime you're studying with an ology, ecology, well management, predator management, these things get bigger and bigger the longer you chew on them. So appreciate the complexity. But we just want to know, does factor X increase well abundance? If we put out feeders, can we do that? If we control predators, do we see an increase? So we try to simplify it, but if you're operating in a system that is complex, you've got to consider all that multitude of factors. And again, at the coffee shop, uh, and, and again, in quail management circles, we've always said if it rains, we'll have quail. If it don't, we won't. And rainfall is a very powerful part of that equation. Uh, for many years, Fred Guthrie, who worked in South Texas for most of his career, said that about half the annual variation was due to rainfall. More recently, Fidel Hernandez and Lenny Brennan have looked at this over a period of years, and about 93% of the variability that they see in the age ratios of the harvest uh, are correlated to uh, or explained by April to August rainfall. So again, rainfall is important. Uh, and Fidel and them say they did say on well managed habitat, so they did make that caveat. But you got to ask yourself, okay, if, if rain accounts for 50 or 90 percent of the variation, who accounts for the rest? And in my opinion, managers do, and, and our knowledge of how to manage the land with quail in mind is still an important factor. So here you got a guy, a land manager in South Texas, and he's acknowledging that in the foreground that that uh, aerator there, roller chopping, is going to be an important tool for him. But he's also acknowledging he's got to have some help from the weather. 
Uh, over the last two years, especially in the rolling plains, we've been mired in drought, and we can either just bemoan the situation and say, well, we're not going to do anything, or we can do what I call cock the hammer. And cocking the hammer means that we've taken care of some basics like brush management, grazing management, soil disturbance as appropriate, and now we're waiting for the rainfall to pull the trigger. So drought cocks the hammer, rain pulls the trigger. Unfortunately, we just uh, haven't been able to pull the trigger lately. All right, I'm going to move to the next session that I call Thinking Like a Quail. So for the next uh, several minutes, I want you to morph yourself to where you assume the dimensions of a Bob White. You're no longer six feet in height, you're six inches. You no longer weigh 200 pounds, you weigh six ounces. So at six inches tall and six ounces, ask yourself, how many bobcats do I whoop? How many Cooper's hawks do I weigh that? And the answer is one. After that, you're dead meat. So, another little polling question here. What song serves as the national anthem of quail management? Let's have a little fun here. Is it Free Bird by Leonard Skinner? Killing Me Softly with His Song by Roberta Flack? Live Fast, Love Hard, Die Young, and Leave a Beautiful Memory by Farron Young? Or Glory Days by uh, Bruce Springsteen? Which of those is it? Give you about 10 seconds to indicate your choice on that. Whenever you're ready, I'll know we'll close the poll. And as the polling results will come up, Matt, the correct answer is Freebird. And I suspect most of you got that right. So I'm going to move on while the uh, poll results are coming up. But Freebird does indeed serve. Oh, look here. According to the poll, almost half of you thought it was Live Fast, Love Hard, and Die Young by uh, Farron Young. And that, that could be an appropriate mantra. But the answer for the national anthem is Freebird. Now, I suspect some of you on this uh, viewership are too old to remember a group that was quite popular in the late 70s, early 80s by the name of Leonard Skinner. And in their song, Free Bird, the lyrics say, and this bird you cannot change. So, oh, wouldn't we be great if we could get those quail to roost up in a cottonwood tree 40 feet. It would remove them from a lot of predation. If we could get them to nest 35 feet up in a in an elm tree, that would be great. But we can't change the bird that we have. And uh, we ought to be thankful for that, really, because the bird that's been selected out there is the one that we enjoy as hunters. If you look at this slide, I want you to kind of look at it and see how many quail can you see here. And I hope, I don't know if my pointer is, I don't know if my pointer obvious. Here's one, two, three, four, five. And there's one somewhere back in here that you can see a little bit. But my point is that those critters are hard to see. They have certain adaptations, certain advantages that help them stay afloat in a sea of predators. Camouflage is one of those, and certainly a lot of um, certainly a lot of other adaptations that uh, if, if you if you enroll in quail masters or go to a quail appreciation day, we spend quite a bit of time thinking about that. But a quail's life is dictated by the threat. Of predation. It doesn't uh, doesn't encourage us or allow us to go out and try to think we've got to eliminate every predator out there because predation has been a big part in shaping the quail that we love to hunt. But the threat of predation shapes every, every second of a quail's life. Every time that rooster whistles, he's telling the whole world, here I am. And uh, a hawk or a bobcat might sure take advantage of that. Every time he's out foraging for seeds, He's vulnerable. Uh, when he sits on that, uh, when he or she sits on that nest of 12 to 14 eggs for 23 days, they're extremely vulnerable to a long list of predators. So we can all we must always appreciate that predation is a big part of quail management, and we've got to think about that from a quail and how we manage the habitat to hopefully tip the odds to the quail and away from the predator. This is a little exercise that, uh, that we play at the Bob White Brigade called Run for Your Life. And uh, this individual is a red-tailed hawk. 
and this young lady that was much faster was a Cooper's Hawk. And then you can see the uh, the hula hoops here. The hula hoops are low bushes, uh, plum thickets, those kind of things that act as a, what I call a quail house or a, a uh, covert. And as long as the quail can get inside that hula hoop, they're safe from predators. And so it's quite a fun game, and it's uh, quite an educational little exercise. But at some point in time, we have a rancher coming here that looks at here and says, i got too much brush. So you can visualize if we strike up the D7 and start clearing brush, does that tip the odds to the quail or to the enemies of quail? So that's a very interesting little exercise, and it, uh, it's very useful. But I want you to think about, again, how those actions uh, do have an impact. This fellow is, uh, is not doing a courtship display for this young lady. He's actually counting the number of prospective quail nests. So the two things that he's being conscious of is nesting cover and escape cover. Nesting cover would be this little, this fine little blue stem. Little blue stem, if it's available, is always a preferred nesting substrate. But there's a lot of other grasses uh, that can accommodate that. Tabosa grass, silver blue stem, uh, those kinds of perennial warm season bunch grasses or what quail like to nest in. Escape cover, we're talking about the brush back here. And we'll make some additional references to escape cover later on. Now again, we tend to look at quail and quail, hab or quail habitat from our perspective, our perspective being five and a half to six feet tall. But in order to look at it through the world of a quail, you got to lie down, you've got to put your right ear on the ground and look out your left eye. You're going to be looking at the world through the perspective of a quail, and it's going to change your perspective, I submit to you. So here I've got a, a landowner that's laying down looking at the world through the eyes of a quail. I encourage all of you to, to think about doing that because it really does your, change your perspective from six feet to six inches. And then we've got to think about the plants. As we look out there and as we make judgments about certain plants, these are good, these are bad. If I've got my cowboy hat on, looking at it from a grazing perspective, a lot of prickly pear is not a particularly good thing. If I'm looking at it from a quail situation, that prickly pear becomes more important to me. So we've got to keep in mind that a weed is not always a four-letter word. And if we're looking at the world through the eyes of a camouflage cowboy hat, it can change things. Here I have a group of uh, uh, quail biologists from the southeastern United States at the Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch this last summer. And they're reciting the pledge to broomweed. And that pledge to broomweed goes something like this. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to common broomweed and to the cover for which it provides. One canopy over quail, continuous, providing usable space for bobwhites. So just a humorous way of acknowledging that although some plants are not good for a grazing enterprise, they can be very beneficial in a wildlife sense. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said that what is a weed but a plant whose virtues have yet to be discovered. And as we aspire to be quail managers, we've got to appreciate that while that situation looks pretty trashy to a cattle rancher, things like snow on the mountain, croton, sunflowers, some of those kind of things are again can be very valuable plants. So we've got to keep in mind what the goal what our goal is and then what type of a hat we want to look at that under. That's okay, usable space. Let's change gears just a little bit. Usable space is a phrase that was coined back in about 1997 by Dr. Fred Guthrie. The concept has been appreciated for a lot longer than that, but he put a name to it, and it's a good name. And basically, when we say usable space, we're asking ourselves the question, how much of our landscape can quail call home 365 days a year? Is it 10%, 80%? Our goal as a quail manager, if we want to maximize quail, we've got to maximize usable space. And we've got to make that usable space available to us 365 days out of the year. Or what Dr. Guthrie would say, saturating usable space and time. And as we look at this landscape, if I had a poll question, I would ask you what percent of that landscape looks usable, but it, it's very usable. Now you can see that they've done some brush sculpting in here. Uh, they've been cognizant of the fact that we've got to leave some brush, but you've got some open areas here. So that's, uh, that's a nice design. That's a nice looking landscape, if you will, for Bob White Quail, this particular one being taken in Stonewall County. Okay. So brush, excuse me just a minute. Brush and grass, as we think about our various needs out there and the various things that we can manipulate, uh, those are the two most important, in my opinion. Quail are going to have bare ground, and for those of you in Victoria or that part of Texas, coastal prairie, East Texas, 
That would be a bigger concern than it is for those of us west of the 100th meridian. Bare ground is not normally a limiting factor for us. And then we've got to have interspersion. We've got to be able to have that, those brush coverts kind of cut and pasted across that landscape to where they're most useful for quail. So what kind of uh, habitat evaluation might we think about? What do we need to look at as we consider how to cut and paste those? This is the Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch, which uh, is located up in Fisher County. And this, um, this image that you're looking at on the right here with the different colors of brown is the density of quail on the research ranch as we gauged it by uh, helicopter counts conducted during 2007 and 2008. We use the helicopter counts twice a year, and we think it gives us pretty good ideas of uh, not only our actual quail abundance, but the spatial uh, variation of where these quail are at. So as I look at that landscape, and if I want to improve quail and have maximize quail rate, I've got to appreciate that I can look in some areas, suggest that, hmm, the pretty good quail numbers there. But then as I look at other areas, not very many quail numbers right here. As I look at that under the, the guise of what I call patternology, can we see a pattern there? And can, can we dissect that pattern and say, what's the deal? Certainly, we have these darker areas that are the honey holes. And you can visualize these on your own property where you can always go to find quail. But then again, there's some weak links out there. There's just some places that are sinks. They're not holding up uh, their part of the bargain here. So we need to be able to contrast those and say, what's the difference in, on the landscape between a honey hole and this weak link? And if we can, and we'd like what we'd like to do is be able to cut and paste this one and put it over here to where, again, we have more usable space in the landscape. So philosophically, that's what we want to do as a student of quail. Here, little Annie is looking at uh, how we might be able to change that usable space. And there's, again, we, we ask ourselves, can we do it over the entire landscape? And again, that's going to be dictated, for the most part, by our management according to two things, our brush management and our grazing management. Again, reiterating the importance to, of rainfall. But if we want to cock the hams, I did list predator control. Those are intensive management strategies. But we're going to make probably 80% of whatever gain we see in quail management by using these extensive management strategies, our brush management, our quail management, I mean, our grazing management. OK, have a little uh, fun with you right now. Back when we started the concept of brush sculpting back in 1997, a newspaper writer sent me a column where he was calling that feng shui for quail. Now, it's during the lunch hour. Maybe some of you are eating Chinese food. Until several years ago, I didn't know what feng shui meant. But I've been educated now. Feng shui is the ancient Chinese art of manipulating and arranging your surroundings to attract positive life energy or chi, so that it flows smoothly, unblocking any obstructions in your body or environment. Sounds like something you'd want to do if you were starting a yoga class, but let's think about it. That's a pretty good example of feng shui. Feng shui evolved from the theory that people are affected for better or worse by their surroundings. And I submit to you that Bob White would feel the same way uh, if they were in a situation uh, like behind us here. So again. Think about that concept. It's basically nothing more than landscaping, either interior design or uh, landscaping uh, on the, on the uh, back 40. And that's what we want to think about relative to quail. All right, let me get you back on the page here. Another little quiz. How many eggs are in a typical quail nest during the month of June? Three to five, six to nine, or 12 to 14? Give me your best estimate of that. And notice that I specified in June. It would be different if I had said August. All right, I'm going to move on with the correct answer. And uh, Eleanor will uh, summarize the poll here in just a second. Correct answer is 12 to 14 eggs. Again, if I'd asked you for August, it would have been less than that. They tend to have larger nests earlier in the breeding season than later in the nesting season. And it looks like most of you got, or at least half of you got that correct. 45 out of 108 uh, had the correct answer on that. So good. Okay, now I want to talk about uh, perhaps 
one of the more controversial or potentially controversial aspects of our topic today, and that's some pinch points. What are some of the friction points as we talk about the dominant land use for most of uh, Texas, that being uh, grazing, livestock management, versus wildlife management today, and especially as it relates to quail. And I'm going to suggest to you that there are two potential sticking points or friction points, stocking rate and brush control. So we're going to focus in a little bit about that and uh, look and see how that might uh, affect our quail management. If I was to ask you this question, do cows and quail compete? Think about that. Think about it just a minute. Do cows and quail compete? We often talk about cows and deer make a good mix. Uh, maybe goats and deer don't make such a good mix. But do cows and quail, are they a good mix or not? My answer would be a definite, it depends. But cows and quail do compete, in my opinion. They compete for forage. Now, quail don't eat that grass that old bossy's eating here. But quail need that grass for nesting cover. And it's the same grass. It's our warm season bunch grasses. The Sados grama, the uh, Tavosa, the little blue stem, those kind of things. So we got to think about that. Quail need that grass as well. Uh, a, a pasture that goes on graze is not wasted, certainly from the standpoint of quail. And then the brush. Do quail need that? Do cows need that brush? Is there competition for it? You might think, well, not directly, but indirectly there is because cows don't need much brush. And a common management strategy across most of Texas is, is brush control and brush management. So we might take out all but a few bull mosquitoes out there from a cow standpoint. But quail have got to have more cover. So indirectly, they do compete for the amount of brush that's out there. And if we want to think about the two ends of that spectrum, again, you get the you get the fellow over here with the uh, spotless Stetson, and you got one over here with an orange cap. This represents your livestock interest. This represents your quail interest over here. And can those two coexist? And certainly they can. Can we maximize cattle production at the same time we maximize quail production? I would argue we cannot do that. And any time you've got one gentleman that's in charge of the grazing lease, another one in charge of the hunting lease, that's a pretty good recipe for headaches because they both see things a little bit differently and they're both trying to optimize for their respective end of the equation. So uh, if you've ever heard me talk about a program, I encourage you to examine those situations under the brim of what I call a camouflage cowboy hat. Camouflage cowboy hat recognizes and anticipates some of those trade-offs. OK, it's so during the lunch hour. Let's have a brief devotional from my preacher. This is Preacher Paul. And I often I enjoy Preacher Paul's sermons. and. Uh, I'm always listening for little jewels that I might be able, little sermonettes that I might be able to use somewhere else. And these two that he often says, first one being, I want you to know I'm not mad at any of you. And the second one is, you're free to choose your actions, but you're not free to choose the consequences. And I maintain that those two things right there are also important outside the church building uh, on the back 40. So I hereby invoke Preacher Paul's precautionary professions because, again, we're going to be talking about potential conflicts between grazing management, cattle, and quail management. But I want to acknowledge and I firmly believe that a rancher with bird dogs is the best friend a quail has. I want to repeat that. A rancher with bird dogs is the best friend a quail has. Because if he has bird dogs, that tells me his recreation is quail hunting. And he's going to be anticipating those trade-offs and probably managing a bit more conservatively than one that doesn't have quail in mind. So that's a that's a very desirable kind of landowner, in my opinion. I wish everyone had met a bird dog. We've got to realize again, we just got to appreciate the fact that we can't maximize livestock and wildlife simultaneously. Did I say we can't have cows and quail together? Absolutely not. But I can't maximize the number of pounds of beef per acre and maximize the, pound, the number of quail coverage per acre at the same time. Got to anticipate those trade-offs. So as we search for those camel cowboy hats, again, we've got to appreciate quail habitat. And when I say appreciate, I mean judge with heightened awareness. Know what the needs of that quail are and what the needs of that cow are. What are the uh, potentials for complementarity? What are the potentials for, uh, for competition? 
and incorporate that concern and that knowledge into especially two management decisions, those being the stocking rate, or what I call grass sculpting, and then in our brush management. So if we go in with the knowledge of what quail habitat needs to look like, then we can adjust our stocking rates and our brush management plans and hopefully have a win-win for both. Not optimal for both, but a win-win. I'd like to use this slide to summarize um, from the hunting standpoint, at least, the concern about cows and quail. And I heard this during our first quail master's class back in 2005 from a hunting, uh, let's see, a guide in South Texas. So keep in mind, he's, he's leasing country in South Texas uh, for hunting properties. And this is the way he summarizes the conflict between cows and quail. When they take your lease check and buy round bales, you know you're in trouble. I'll repeat that. When they take your lease check and buy round bales, you know you're in trouble. So what he's saying is when they've taken the money that I've given them to promote good quail management and they're having to buy round bales because they're out of grass, I'm on the lose at the end of that stick. I think that's a pretty good synopsis of cows and quail. Okay. Let's have another question here. What is the best grazing system? If you've got quail in mind, what's the best grazing system for quail in Texas? No grazing, continuous grazing, rotational grazing, or patch grazing? Give you a few minutes to think about that. And if you've ever heard me speak, you know that I'm a, uh, one of my degrees is from Texas Tech University, and uh, I often uh, acknowledge what I call the Texas Tech theory of relativity. The Texas Tech theory of relativity simply states it depends. I'm not going to advocate any of those particular grazing regimes to the exclusion of others. All of them can be useful. Uh, as we're in dry, as we're mired in dry conditions like we are now, no grazing is certainly an appropriate strategy. If we get back into an El Nino uh, weather pattern, no grazing might be appropriate for two years to let some things heal over and uh, get some hair back on the landscape. But at some point in time, some type of grazing would be beneficial to you, whether that's continuous, rotational, patch grazing. There's a lot of factors that go into that. Keep in mind the stocking rates. Keep in mind that uh, while a desirable range condition class in Victoria might be a fair condition for, rain, for good quail country, uh, if you're on the western edge of the Bob White, it's going to be, you're going to need excellent condition rangeland to provide that same type of habitat. So it changes as we go over certain uh, precipitation gradients and soil types. So again, don't try to corner me into an argument about uh, you like this particular grazing system to the exclusion of others. I'm a fan of General George Patton who once said that never tell people how to do things, tell them what you want done and they will surprise you with their ingenuity. So using that as our directive, this is what I want for quail. I want nesting cover. I want brush. I want bare ground. I want forbs, weeds, and I want insects. So if you've got a grazing system that will uh, accomplish those things in the right proportions, it ought to be good enough for quail. But be wary. Be wary as you talk to different people because you're going to get different uh, opinions. Here are two of my bird dogs, and uh, obviously they're not agreeing on the location of the cubby. So keep in mind that as you talk to a range manager, you may get a different opinion than a wildlife manager who may be different than a cattle manager. Keep in mind that a resident landowner, an absentee landowner, may have different goals. If you're an absentee landowner and you ask your neighbor next door, you've got lots of grass he doesn't have, He'll tell you that, uh, you know, that grass can get too thick for quail. Again, it can at times, not, not typically a problem in West Texas. And as we talk about the, the person that has the grass lease versus the hunting lease. So all of these are seeing things from their own perspective, not necessarily wrong, uh, but they're not seeing things, uh, they're not seeing the situation or the equation uh, through the same set of eyes. I appreciate that. And ask yourself from a grazing standpoint, is grazing required? Is it permissible? Is it optional? Or is it contradictory to quail management goals? And as I think about these items, and again, if I go from 
a 45 inch rainfall zone to a 15 inch rainfall zone, out in that drier country, grazing is not going to be required in the same sense that it would be required in that 45 inch rainfall zone to promote good quail habitat. It might be permissible, it may be optional. So figure out where your uh, particular uh, land on land situation and weather will have a big impact on that. From the hunter's perspective, how much grass do you need? A good landscape for quail needs to recognize that dog work is the key reason for hunting. A gentleman or a group of gentlemen is going to come out of Houston or Dallas to pay you four to fourteen dollars an acre for quail hunting. He's not out there to pot shoot quail or shoot them as they're underneath a deer feeder. He's out there to watch dogs, and that's the essential element of a good quail lease is good habitat, be able to see your dog, and good habitat for those quail to hold so you can appreciate the performance that your dog is doing. Quail hunting has often been called grand opera, and it is a quite a spectacle. It's quite a sight. I won't try to describe that, but hopefully most of you have done some quail hunting. You ought to be able to see your bird dogs most of the time. That's a good rule of thumb for the amount of brush you need out there. So one of my rules of thumb for brush is, when people say, do I have enough brush or do I have too thick brush? I say, I'd like to be able to see my bird dog most of the time. And I have white bird dogs, and I can see them pretty visibly. But i got to have enough grass out there. I don't want those bob whites to take on the running habits of blue quail. I want them to behave like a bob white ought to behave. And if I can do that with grass cover, that's the ideal situation for that frosty December morning. Again, if we think about the relationship between grass and brush, if I've got grass here on the, on the y-axis and the amount of brush here on the x-axis, certainly I can have quail over here at this end where I've got a lot of brush but not very much grass. But let me ask you, would you like to hunt in that situation? No, because you can't see your bird dog. Obviously, I can get over here, and if I've got a lot of grass, I don't need much, when I say a lot of grass, taller grasses, I don't need much brush. But you say, well, if I'm interested in cattle too, I'm not going to have that much grass out there. So what would be a, maybe an ideal situation here? We might say, well, this would be, right in here would be, might be where we want to try to maximize quail at. But we've got to appreciate that it's not a point on the line. There are a range of values out through here, and all of them can be good quail habitat. That demonstrates a concept that Dr. Guthrie refers to as slack. We're not building cabinets here. We're managing rangelands. We're managing them with B7s and 1,100 pound cattle. So we're not going to be able to just do fine detail work. We've got to keep in mind this range of values that is good for us and uh, be able to uh, adapt our management accordingly. All right, so that brings us to the fact that we need to have a pretty good understanding of quail habitat. And I've already told you one technique that I use. That's the bird dog technique about can I see quail, can I see my bird dog most of the time. But years, several years ago, I developed what I call the softball habitat evaluation technique, or SHET, uh, as a uh, acronym. Be careful with your enunciation. There was a nice little webinar that's a, a little webisode, about an eight-minute webisode, on Texas Wildlife Association's website called the Softball Habitat Evaluation Technique. So if you're going to YouTube, you can find that, and it'll lead you through it. I'm just going to hit a few high spots. One of the basic things about the Softball Habitat Evaluation Technique is that I'll be able to throw that softball in the air. The quail is the softball. If I, if I can throw that softball in the air from one quail house to the next, and in this case, that's a nice quail house, Here's a number of quail houses back over here. If I can throw that softball in the air from one quail house to the next, that ought to be sufficient woody cover that I'll uh, have decent landscape for quail. But I often point out that if this guy is the one that's throwing the softball, and hopefully you recognize him as Hall of Fame pitcher Melvin Ryan, your brush might be a little too thinly dispersed out there. Here are some action levels or thresholds that I want you to think about if you're using the softball habitat evaluation technique. As a minimum, we'd like to have 300 nest clumps per acre of warm season grasses. And these are about the size of a basketball. So think about it. You'd like to have 300 basketballs per acre 
out there as potential nest sites. Again, those are some type of bunch grass. The bosa grass or prickly pear serves adequately too. Uh, if you're on your favorite horse with your lariat, you would want to be able to rope from one of them to the next. So that gives you some idea. If you're on the infield of that softball field, you'd like to have about 25 of those on the infield of that softball. And why do we want 300 as opposed to 30? You got to try to outsmart your enemies here. It's, just, it's like the shell game at the carnival. If I'm a quail, I want to be able to lay my 14 eggs in a clump of grass and then go undetected for 23 days. So the more clumps, the more shells, if you will, that I have on the landscape, the better my odds are for doing that. As so I toss that softball pitching distance, which is 46 feet, I shouldn't be able to see that softball. If I can, it means I don't have enough ground cover. I've got to lighten up on my stocking rate. When that ball hits the ground, it should roll with ease. It might roll a foot, it might roll four feet. If it sticks upon impact, then lo and behold, the grass is too thick for quail. A lot of little similarities between softball and quail management. And I encourage you to check out that webisode, and you'll go into that in more detail. And again, we ought to have those quail houses about a softball throw apart, and we'll be able to step from one food plant to the next. All right, let me real quickly introduce you what I call Rollins Rules of Plant Succession. Two of them. Know your plants. Know how to manipulate them. I don't care if you're managing for white-faced steers or white-tailed ears or black balled cows or Bob Whites. If you'll keep those two things in mind, it'll help you become a better student of that uh, critter and be a better manager of that critter. So when I say uh, know how to manipulate them, Use the tools that Leopold first defined in 1933, the axe, the plow, the cow, and the fire. Learn how those can be applied to foster the suites of plants that are important to our particular critter, in today's case, Bob Whites. When I say know your plants, this is often a sticking point for many of us. Uh, Rick Ulanix and Kent Mills and Steve Nelly and a lot of us like to get a group out of of you out there on the, on the back 40 and we'll start asking you what plant is this and I often ask you if the word if the names of plants were words if the names of plants were words would you consider yourself a silver-tongued orator or a neanderthal and unfortunately most of them would get closer to the neanderthal side of the equation because they go ugh ah we don't know what a lot of our good range plants are and this is really a, a shame and one of the things that, again, that we harp at you quite a bit is to become, if you want to become a better student of quail, become a better student of plants. And one of the things we like to do is show you how you can create your own field guides. Uh, these, are, these are produced with a, a flatbed scanner, and we produce a page here that shows that particular plant. It's even got the seeds on it. And you can make your own field guides. So one of the laments, one of the excuses, people come up to you at the end of the field and say, well, if I had a good field guide, I'd be a better student of plants. Well, my uh, admonition to you is make your own field guide. Customize it to your property, and, uh, and you'll become a better student. It's a great exercise. All, there's also a webisode called the Digital Plant Press. So, again, if you go to the TWA's website and look for the Digital Plant Press, it'll tell you how you can make your own plant ID. So, as we begin to wrap this thing up, you got to ask yourself, as the landowner interested in quail, you got to ask yourself this question: Does my management favor quail, or does it favor the enemies of quail? That should always be foremost in your mind before you bring that uh, aerial applicator in, before you uh, before you uh, unload those three pot loads of stock or steers. Think about those equations through a quail's eyes and ask yourself, are these going to favor quail or are they going to favor the enemies of quail? Am I going to make quail more, am I going to predispose them to higher predation rates if I do X, Y, or Z? Think about again, how can I maximize, how can I establish usable space across the landscape? And you're going to do that, again, primarily through your grazing management and your brush management. It's the kind of habitat, I mean, if we're grading habitats, if we're scoring habitats, this particular one you see on the screen, that would be a, out of a scale from 1 to 10, that would be a 9 or a 10 because the interspersion is beautiful, uh, great nesting cover, very huntable country, so all the things are there. So learn how to begin to judge, score, 
appreciate and then sculpt that type of habitat. And then as you implement practices A, B, or C, develop a monitoring program to where five years from now you can say, well, what Rollins told me five years ago did or didn't work. Be able to go out there and do whistle counts, keep records. Again, there are a number of ways to do this. You can do them with whistle counts. You can do them with helicopter counts, a lot of different ways. And uh, there are people that uh, are a phone call or an email away that can help you get uh, certain ways to do that. And again, there are some websites also at the TWA website on how to do uh, whistle counts. Uh, there's a great one on the dummy nest. It's called, uh, if, you, if you don't look at any of the rest of them, check out the one called, you can, well, can't get my pen to work for whatever reason. Check out the ones called uh, Dummy Nest. You can learn a lot from a dummy. I encourage you to become a student of quail or become a better student of quail. And there are several aspects of that, observation, experimentation, evaluation, and implementation. So learn from your neighbors, learn from yourself. A number of ways that you can get continuing education as a student of quail, workshops, tours, books, online, self-discovery. I'm going to recommend three books that ought to be on your bookshelf. Uh, these are not expensive. These particular ones cost you around 15, 18 bucks in the online bookstores. Beef Brush and Bob White's, the second edition. And then On Bob White's uh, by Dr. Guthrie. Uh, Beef Brush and Bob White's by uh, Dr. Hernandez and Dr. Guthrie. And then if you're a more serious student of quail, the uh, more comprehensive uh, book would be Texas Quails, edited by Lenny Brennan. That will cost you about 30 bucks, I think. So those are three good books that you ought to have on your bookshelf. Again, a number of online resources, uh, Texas Wildlife Association. Uh, there's a really good little webisode on plant succession. I would encourage you to check that one out. There are several e -quail, or several electronic newsletters that are being published in Texas. Uh, this is the one that I published in conjunction with the uh, Quail Research Ranch, the eQuail newsletter. If you go to this website, you can uh, sign up for that. It's free. And with that, Eleanor, it looks like I've got about 10 minutes left, so hopefully we'll generate some questions. If I can answer anything after the webinar, and don't hesitate to email at d-rollins at tamu.edu or check out the uh, website at the Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch at quailresearch.org. And remember, and this is something that I uh, espouse at every opportunity, every quail is a trophy. So with that, Eleanor, I'd be happy to address any questions. All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, so. If anyone has any questions, please post them to all participants in the chat pa chat panel over to the right-hand side. And we have a question here. Um, what are your thoughts on releasing healthy pen-reared birds into suitable habitat, not for any purpose other than pleasure and to gain attachment of sorts for a landowner's management plan? Well, interesting question. Uh, the way that you have uh, added some sideboards onto it, uh, Certainly, you can, you're, you're welcome to do that. Uh, if you ever anticipate releasing pen raised quail as a means of jump starting a quail population, it ain't going to happen. Pen raised birds or what the farm reared or, or uh, domestic quail, uh, they've been developed and selected under different conditions than those on the back 40. And so, if you drop 100 of them out on your property, chances are by the end of the month you might have 10 of them left. So, they're just not very survival in a predator-rich environment. All right. So I'm not seeing any more questions. If anyone else has got any questions, please make sure you're typing them in that chat box. All right, here's another one. What is your opinion on the large amount of eyeworms found in quail in the last two years? Well, we didn't go into the eyeworm situation. This is something that we started looking at three years ago at the Quail Research Ranch up in Fisher County, and we found that about half of our eyeworm, about half of our quail had eyeworms, and they averaged about six worms per bird. Uh, in the subsequent two years, we've been looking at quail from 31 different counties across West Texas and Western Oklahoma, and that, and that same percentage applies. So, uh, about half the birds have quail. Uh, if you've seen one with um, a mass of eyeworms, you've got to ask yourself, how in the world was that quail surviving? 
we don't know where that's going to take us. Uh, we're very intrigued by it. It's a very intriguing ecological uh, situation at the, at the present time. We have no cure. We don't have anything that you can treat or feed with and uh, expect to impact that. We do have some additional research that will start later this year about uh, trying to develop a medicated feed at least to attack the sequel worms and then hopefully they'll have some impact on the eye worms as well. If you want to read more about the eye worms, again, go to the Rolling Plank Quail Research Ranch's website. We've got a lot of information there. All right. We have a couple questions here. Just uh, what are your thoughts on CRP and then thoughts on the 1985 Farm Bill and Quail? Well, my thoughts on CRP are that uh, it was great quail habitat. And again, let me let me specify here. We've got two different CRP patterns. One of them was with native grasses, and one of them might have been with, with exotic grasses. So if we're looking at uh, a native mixture of blue stems and grammas versus a, uh, a monoculture of uh, buffalo grass or climb grass, the latter are not going to they're not going to perform to the same level as the as the former. But a CRP contract typically was very good quail habitat for the first two or three years, and then the grasses became established, choked out a lot of the forbs, didn't have woody cover on those CRP contracts, so the quality of it from a quail standpoint probably dropped off. A lot of those contracts are 25 years old now, and the brush has uh, come back on and made them more habitable for quail at this point in time. So it's kind of at the beginning of the contract and at the end of the contract, they tend to be better habitat. There are some things you can do, visit with your local NRCS, uh, if you're selling the CRP about some things that you might do, it's called mid-level management that could help uh, improve those sites for quail. And was there another aspect of that question? Uh, there were thoughts on the 1985 farm bill on quail. Well, that was, the CRP was the same, one of the same. big things about the 85 farm bill, yes. There are some other things, uh, there are some other things that have come out like uh, quail focus areas and uh, uh, Equip area. So if, if you if you if you do the farm bill programs, there are some opportunities. Buffer strip CP33. There are some helpful things there that can help you improve your local landscape for quail. All right, and then another question. Um, what's your gut feeling with this one? It says, "Will bobwhite quail populations rebound to former bounty in rolling plains if and when we resume a more favorable pattern?" Well, I got to thank they are. Now, I am a uh, I'm an eternal optimist. I guess I may be a cotton farmer at heart here, but uh, yes, I think they will. Um, our quail populations again are at record lows, but our habitat is still intact. We still have large expanses of habitat. We still have birds out there, and probably more than most people think. Uh, I'm going to challenge you to go out to your favorite spot uh, the last week in May or mid May. And, and turn down your radio and get away from the highway where you can hear those Bob Whites whistling, I think you'll probably be surprised. There are always more quail out there than what you think. And if we can get back into a wetter season, it's going to take at least two years. I'm going to argue it'll take more than two. It'll probably take three years. And the odds of getting three years of good rainfall are not high, but i got to expect that we're going to have some quail out there. All right. The next question is, um, how would you count quail through aerial surveys? Well, we worked with uh, the Caesar Claiborne Institute a couple of years ago to modify the helicopter count. Of course, helicopter counts have been done for the last 30 years or more on counting white-tailed deer. And you will see quail during a helicopter count, during a deer count, but we've uh, modified it to where it is, we think, a very efficient way of counting quail. We fly low and we fly slow. We fly about half the the altitude and half the uh, speed of the typical deer survey, and we're counting from a four-seater helicopter. There's more information on, on that uh, at the Cedar Clayburg's um, website, uh, or if you'll email me, I can send you a, a PDF of the uh, publication that came from that. Basically, you count the number of miles of transect that you flow, how many quail per mile did you see, and then you divide that by half, and that gives you an estimate of the density in terms of acres per quail. All right, we have another question uh, asking, what do you mean by bare ground when you said bare ground earlier? Well, if you look at the slide uh, that I'm showing here at the end here, bare ground is, is literally bare ground like that. A plant community that's dominated by warm season grasses is always going to have these 
interstitial areas, areas between the plants that are dominated by bare ground. And those bare ground areas are critical for the germination and proliferation of some of the good food plants like forbs. Again, quail are, are, are a ground dwelling creature. They've got to have enough bare ground and easy access at uh, quail level to get through. Look at that webinar that I uh, recommended to you on uh, plant succession. And that will do a good job of illustrating the type of bare ground and interspersion at quail height, quail height level that you want for quail. All right, our next question uh, goes back to eyeworms. Uh, are eyeworms prevalent in other species such as turkeys, or is this just a quail issue? Well, eyeworms occur in, in a lot of different game birds, and we have been sampling some uh, turkey heads, and we're finding them at a lower incidence than what we see in quail. Uh, but yes, you would expect to find them in the very lesser prairie chickens, or probably greater prairie chickens. They're in, they're in a number of different game birds but they haven't reached the levels that we're seeing uh, in the bottom one quail. The most we found at this point in the game is 62 eye worms in one quail. And these worms are, are almost a half inch long. It's just amazing that a quail can function. But uh, what got us onto that was the number of dead quail that we have diagnosed as trauma flying into something. So we think it may be related to that. Okay, our next question. How are the nesting conditions going into the spring and summer? Well, anywhere from fair, anywhere from fair to terrible. Uh, and again, if you've had uh, many cattle, I'm not going to say how many, but if you've had many cattle or your particular site is prone to attack by desert termites, then your nesting cover probably is stinks. Uh, if, if it's a situation where it's been lightly grazed or ungrazed over the last year or so, hopefully you've got enough uh, nesting cover that you'll be in good shape. And that's really important because hopefully, again, when it rains, we, can, we want quail to have nesting cover early in the season. Those early nests are especially critical to us. We make or break a quail hatch with a June hatch. And so we want those quail to have, they'll, they'll be pairing off here, probably already are in South Texas, uh, here at the, uh, in San Angelo area, they'll start pairing off here in the next two weeks. We want those quail to have an opportunity to nest early and be successful with those early clutches. Okay, uh, next question. Is it possible to have quail with large numbers of feral hogs? Interesting. Uh, if you think about where feral hogs are the worst, rolling plains in South Texas, you can't discount the fact that those are still the two of the prime areas for, for Bob White. So, Hogs are one of a long list of potential nest predators. But in areas, uh, some areas that have had high dense or have had dense hog populations for quite a while can still have good quail populations. So the, the uh, math, the algebra is not so simple to say, if I've got hogs, I can't have quail. Uh, again, hogs are just one of many critters out there. I'm not asking to protect the hogs. If you've got a lot of hogs, I take them down by whatever measure legally you can do that. But you may or may not see an increase in your nest success from that. Okay, we have a few more questions. What is the status of the translocation project in Shackleford County? Well, we just started the project, a uh, three year project uh, on the Shackleford Stevens County line where we're trapping and translocating wild birds from uh, the San Angelo area and west, wild bob whites, moving those over to the Stevens County, which until about 2005 was the epicenter of North Texas quail hunting. Now they have very, very few quail over there. So we've released at this point in time, we've released about 140 quail. All the hens are radio marked and beyond that, uh, stay tuned and we'll see how they perform. All right, next question. What is your opinion about Milo supplemental feeding along roads? My thoughts about feeding for quail in general conform to this. Listen carefully. If you want to feed and can't afford to feed, then feed. Feeding will, will produce some positive results. It's just terribly expensive. It's inefficient and it's inexpensive. Along the roads, in a feeder, I don't know if it makes that much difference. A lot of people will argue that if you put them in a quail, if you're feeding from a quail feeder, you attract uh, various predators and increased parasitism. We really haven't documented that relative to the predation aspect, at least. Um, but if you choose to feed along the road, that's fine, too. If you want to get really serious about feeding, you better have a good pocketbook to do it. All right. So, yeah, and then we had a couple of follow-ups about that, just about 
um, into the supplemental food supply and along brush. So basically, same answer for all that. That is the best way. I mean, if, if you've got the equipment, if you've got the spreader, and you've got the checkbook to do it, probably feeding it in the brush would be a better option uh, as far as uh, not forcing those quail to get out of the situation. But the predation at quail feeders is perhaps over-exaggerated. Okay, and then we just had a quick uh, comment I'll read out. Um, someone says, um, we're hearing a thin quail more in more quail in the hill country, maybe not in the numbers we would like, but frequently across the landscape, a sign that we are fragmenting and numbers are impacted due to it, but also a testament to the resilience of the species. Well, oh, congratulations to you all. I, I think one of those things is, is a shift in landowners over the hill country over the last 25 years, and uh, the the new landowner, the recreationally oriented landowner, is not pushing the system livestock wise, grazing wise. So that country is uh, becoming more quail friendly over time. Okay, and then we've got one more question for right now. Um, what is the rain forecast for this year? 50% chance of rain. It will or it won't. Uh, to be serious, the uh, climatologists say that we're out or going out of La Nina and going into neutral conditions. So that's about the best news we could have right now is to hope that we are in that in neutral conditions because April and May are typically our wettest months up here. So hopefully we will see good rains in April and May. Uh, all right, we've got one more. Lots of questions today. Um, who was the author of the quote, what is a weed? Ralph Waldo Emerson said what, and he actually said, and a plant is a weed whose virtues have yet to be discovered. All right then, thank you. So if you have any more questions, please post them in that window. For right now, it looks like we're all done with questions. So thank you so much for coming today and giving this presentation on quail management. Uh, Eleanor, could you tell us, tell the uh, listeners how to archive or how to access the archive? version because I've had a number of people call and email me over the last two days wanting to know. Yeah, definitely. So these will be available on our website. If you go, I just posted it to all participants at texas-wildlife.org. You should be able to go to adult education on there and there should be a link to all of our archived webinars. I will try to get this one up um, within the week, um, probably Monday, I'd expect I'd like to try and have it up there by. So you should be able to access those there. And it looks like we have uh, a question. Will that, will that help for quail? I'm not sure what that's relevant to. Oh, a farmer that's going to plant milo and sesame in Haskell, Texas. And she asks, will that, or he asks, will that help for quail? The milo especially will uh, if you can grow it in Haskell County. The problem is uh, over the last 15 years or so, you really can't grow milo unless it's a huge field because you can't keep the deer and the hogs out of it. So if you can grow milo, yes, it's a great plant for quail. They'll utilize it. Uh, the sesame, uh, a little bit less so because the milo will have more cover. It's um, The problem with sesame is that it all shatters out. It's on the ground and the seeds don't last that long on the ground. The milo will remain in the head of the plant and or on the ground, but they'll last much longer, so much more persistent seed. So of those two, I would take uh, milo if I can grow milo. All right, so don't see any more questions. So our, uh, our next program will be on April 18th. It'll cover waterfall habitat and management, and Kevin Cry will be doing that presentation. And not seen any more questions, so just a comment to you guys still here. There will be a post-survey, post-webinar survey that we'd love to hear from you here what you thought of today's program, so please fill that out if you get a chance. And uh, thank you so much for coming today, Dale, and giving this presentation. Anytime I can talk to 80 participants or students of quail and not have to leave San Angel, that's a good day. <laughs> Great, yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. And uh, with that, I think we're out of questions. So looks like I'm going to close this out. Okay. Thank you, Eleanor. Mm -hmm, thank you.